So my name is Jackie Lynham, and on behalf of the Dublin UNESCO City of Literature team, I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening to the Royal Irish Academy for our One Dublin, One Book event. Um, One Dublin, One Book is a Dublin City Council initiative, and it's supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media. And this year's chosen book, if you don't already know, is The Coroner's Daughter by Andrew Hughes and published by Transworld, and we're delighted to have Andrew here this evening, along with the state pathologist Dr. Heidi Oakers and Dr. Jill Roman, and they will be in conversation with Connor Brady. So the event this evening is one of the first events in our calendar. Um, we have a whole month of events planned, so if we would uh, urge you to check out one Dublin, one book.ie to see what else is happening over the month. There are lots of events. Some of them are booked up already, but we do have lots of library events happening right across the city, so do check it out, and they're all free. But do book, as I said, some of them are booked out. Um, and this event will be recorded, and we're recording a few of our events, so you can check it back on the Dublin City of Literature YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, so do tell your friends about it if you enjoyed the event this evening, just to check it up online. So I want to say a huge thank you to Hugh and the Royal Irish Academy for allowing us to use their beautiful room here this evening. I'm sure you'll agree, it's an absolutely stunning venue. And a special thank you to Julianne Mooney and her team for all their help, her, all her help in organising this event. So I'm going to hand you over to this evening's host, Conor Brady. Conor Brady is the author of the Joe Swallow crime novel set in the 19th century Dublin and is a historian of Irish policing. And he was the editor of the Irish Times from 1986 to 2002. So I hope you enjoyed this evening's event. Thanks, Conor. <laughs> Thanks indeed, and um, a great welcome to everybody. It's wonderful to see uh, a, full, a full house. I was saying to Andrew before we came in here, I remember my late colleague Maeve Binchy telling me about her first book tour in the Midwest of America, where she went into some small town and into the hall where she was to give the reading, and there was a man inside, and he kept on looking under the chairs. She said, well, that's not too bad. There's one person here, and eventually she asked him what he was doing. He said, uh, I'm the dog catcher. There's a dog in here somewhere. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's great to see a full house. And um, I suppose there's nothing like a bit of gore and gristle to get Dubliners out for, for an evening's entertainment. Uh, we have a really interesting panel here this evening. And I know we're going to have uh, a, a, a stimulating conversation. And we'll try to keep it as good humoured and as light as we can. Um, but uh, there are times when I suppose we will be going into somewhat dark territory. We'll, we'll, we'll try not to go too deeply into it. Um, uh, Andrew, as you know, is the author of, uh, of this, this wonderful book set in Dublin in the early years of the 19th century. It's, uh, it's at once uh, a crime novel, it's at once a psychological thriller, uh, and it's at once um, it's, it's, it, it's a sociological history of Dublin at that time. A very different Dublin from uh, even the period that I've written about. Uh, the, the Swallow series is set at the end of the 19th century uh, when, when Dublin, if you like, commercial and social Dublin has moved south of the river. Uh, in the early years of the, of the 19th century, um, the north side uh, Capel Street, Rutland Square, that whole area was where the, the quality folk lived. So it's, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting sociological excursion into, uh, into Dublin as it was. Um, um, many of you will also, of course, uh, know Andrew from the, um, the Confessions of, 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 the convictions of, of John Delahunt, uh, another wonderful book which came out of his work as, as an archivist. Uh, the two ladies, um, uh, Heidi and uh, Jill, uh, are fresh from their slab side activities in the uh, in in the in the in the pathologists. Uh, uh, I, I was asking them earlier on. Uh, they're they're both they both come to us from South Africa, from Stellenbosch, which is quite ex an extraordinary coincidence. But uh, we're very lucky to have them, and uh, very welcome they are indeed, uh, both professionally and personally. Um, I was asking them earlier on, was there any possibility of a man ever getting a job in the pathologist's office? <laughs> uh, I think the entire professional staff is female at this stage. Um, so uh, something would have to be done about that. 
<laughs> uh, but that's, that's another day's work. Anyway, we're going to start by asking Andrew to uh, do us a short reading um, from the coroner's daughter. And then we're going to uh, have a general conversation about um, forensics as they were in the 19th century. Forensics as they are now, uh, then and now, and a bit of in between. And then for the last 15, 20 minutes or so, I would hope to open up the discussion to the floor. So there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, if we can structure that way, if everybody's happy to go that way, then we'll, uh, we'll hear from our, from our three speakers and then we can go on to, um, we can go on to a, more, a more informal conversation. Uh, the audience is, is, is small enough to allow us to do that. And we're going to finish up uh, shortly after 8 o'clock. Right, Andrew. Thank you, Connor. You're on. That introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jill and Heidi, for being here. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as Connor said, it's wonderful to have a full house. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do a short reading. This uh, reading comes from early on in the novel. Um, Abigail is collecting her father from the College of Surgeons in York Street, where he's giving a lecture. Uh, she grows tired of waiting for him, so she sneaks into the anatomical theatre where he's working with a cadaver. Um, he's demonstrating the test to discover mercury poisoning. And how that worked was that you would take the contents of the stomach, put it in a glass tube and heat it up, and then place a copper strip over the fumes. And if mercury was present, the copper would take on a silver color. So that is just what has happened. The tip of the copper glinted in the lamplight. It was so pleasing to think that such tiny particles of mercury, dredged up from the dregs of a man's life, could leave such an elegant indicator. I looked around the theatre, expecting the students to be enthralled by the demonstration, but they slouched in their seats, drowsy and indifferent. Father hadn't spoken for a few moments, and I noticed him peering upwards towards the back of the hall where I was standing. He frowned and straightened his lips, but then looked down, perhaps conscious of others following his gaze. He took a piece of cloth to drape over the body, but then he hesitated, for the cloth wasn't large enough to hide both the internal and external organs. Before he could choose which was the more indecent, I slipped out and made my way back to the carriage. After a few minutes, students began to emerge from the college in ones and twos, lifting their lapels against the breeze. Father was among the last to leave. He walked towards the carriage slowly, opened the door and climbed in to sit beside me. He didn't say anything as we set off, just rifled in his satchel to arrange some papers while I looked at the passing houses. I heard him take a breath and say, Abigail, Father, I had no idea that the test for mercury could produce such a clear result. Abigail, what were you doing up there? I only went looking for you, I said. I didn't know that you would be working with a cadaver. But why would you stay for so long? You know that you cannot come to places where such things are displayed. It is just not fair, I said. Proper. He still wore the scarf I had given him that morning, and he loosened it around his neck. What if others had seen you? I'm sure they could have coped, I said. But you know what people are like. Why risk having them say that you are fixated by such morbid subjects? If I were a young man, they would say I was fascinated by them. Father said, you know that I have always been proud of your curiosity. It's a great consolation to be able to share my interests with you, but there are other more important things that I must consider, especially now that your mother is gone, your reputation, your future, even matrimony. Father, please, I said. He held up his hand. I am just mentioning it for you to be aware. There is no need to discuss it today. We remained silent for the remainder of the journey. The rain turned mizzling, then stopped altogether, though the road was still muddy as we approached the house. I said, Father, and he looked at me. Are there other tests like the one you carried out today, tests to detect the presence of poison? He said that there were, though they varied depending on whether the poison was mineral or vegetable. Will you show them to me, I said. If it stops you from sneaking into the anatomical theatre, then yes. After all, he said, reaching for his hat, all the tools we need are here. Thank you. The, um, you can almost get the smell of the Liffey off that, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Heidi, let me just start with you. Um, Andrew has just described the 
the curiosity with which Abigail uh, approaches what's happening, uh, her father's her father's work, uh, and the, the 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 sense of wanting to be involved in it with him. Tell tell us a little bit about what drew you into into this, if I say it, rather morbid specialty within medicine, rather than dealing with living patients, you wanted to deal with dead patients. So ex explain that journey to us. <laughs> I mean, it's actually a strange one because, um, so I was working in obstetrics and gynecology for four years, and I think after a while, I just got so, <laughs> I just got so over it, and I didn't want to see adult people, and I didn't want to deal with live people anymore. But actually, I wanted to specialize. <laughs> I wanted to specialize in, in um, surgery because I like the trauma and you know the um, adrenaline rush type of thing. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I never went into surgery. Somebody then advised me because I liked CSI and, and those type of um, shows on TV. So somebody advised me to think about or consider forensics. And then I was like, oh right, yes, I can actually do that. So then I went for the interview, and I got the job. <laughs> And then, <laughs> and then that just happened. And then I qualified, and I love it. So that's how I got it. And no regrets about leaving the living. No, no, yeah. no. I suppose. Yeah, they, uh, I suppose the one thing about your patients is they're very uncomplaining for the most part, uh, which uh, which must must be a consolation. <laughs> and there's always a story that we have to kind of figure out. So. I, I had a, an uncle, an elderly uncle, a GP down the country many years ago, and he was always complaining. So the people who come into me, they're always sick. <laughs> um, Jill, tell me about, about, your, about your journey into, into pathology. Um, my mother used to love watching um, reality TV. If it wasn't, um, yeah, so if it wasn't, what's the Jerry Springer, then it would be uh, Dr. G. And um, Dr. G is a forensic uh, medical examiner based in America. I don't know if you guys are familiar with her, but there was a show on our satellite TV that used to come on and she would watch all the episodes. And she said to me, uh, Jill, why don't you do this? And that was actually the first time that I thought about it because I never thought of myself doing this kind of work. I love working with children, which I did for a little while, and then I loved psychiatry. But then um, my, a good friend of mine, I was working in psychiatry, and I was supposed to do a ward round to write up seclusions for psychotic aggressive patients. And uh, she helped me out, she covered one of the wards. And it was supposed to be me going to the ward. She helped me out and she got um, attacked. She got hit with a sheben one of the women in the seclusion ward. Oh. You know, the sheben, and um, then I thought to myself, maybe it's not such a good idea. Um, maybe a better, uh, um, yeah, dead than yes. not so well. But um, I've got huge respect for psychiatrists, obviously, and I love the field still, but that is what spurred it all on. Yeah, my mother's motivation and that incident made me think again. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing from both of you almost is that you sort of considered pathology almost as a sort of a soft option, uh, easier than, than actually dealing with, 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 with real life, living, real life. living patients. Yes, yes. But the, so what's the downside of it? What, what's the, uh, Heidi, what, what's, what's the worst part of it? Well, I think you, Maybe it depends on the person. For me, there's no downside. Really? Yes, no. I love every scene, every case. Everything is different, interesting. Wow, well, yeah. But I think somebody else might now have a different opinion. So uh, talk about the typical day. Tell us about your typical day. Um, well, because we're only four in the country currently, Jill's recently joined us. So if uh, one of us are on call for a week and a month, so uh, from a Friday to a Friday. Then we're on call for any suspicious death, so it can be all around island. So uh, Cork, Galway, Limerick, um, Donegal. I did the Creaslow um, explosion cases. I was there for two, three days to do those cases. Um, 
and then we do the suspicious cases. That's for the week. Then after that, once you've completed that week, then you have to do all your reporting, okay. dictate the cases, go through the files, go through, maybe have another meeting with the detectives or the investigation team. Um, then you have to look at the histology, the sections you've taken from all the organs, um, compile that with your report, toxicology. So it's quite a lot that goes into one report. Yes. Um, that, that's what we'll do the rest of the time. But then we also teach, we lecture all over Ireland, uh, Trinity, Galway, UCD, um, RCSI. So a lot of teaching, there's always students at the office. So, and we do the coroners, the non-suspicious cases, so the routine post-mortems. Okay. okay, so there's no such thing as a, as a, as a, as a typical day, it, it's, no. it's entirely, entirely unpredictable, yeah. Yes. That, that, that makes, yeah. yeah what, about court, what, what about court appearances? Um, it's part of our core duty, yeah. especially um, in homicides or suspicious deaths, yeah. where there's a suspect. Um, we get called to court as expert witnesses to present um, our autopsy findings as evidence or to give, um, you know, uh, e uh, um, opinions based on our knowledge and um, expertise and experience. Um, and also we go to, for non-suspicious deaths, or um, we go to inquest court. Okay. Um, so it's part of our regular core duty okay. to go okay. to court. Was that Is part of your training when you were in college to deal with the adversarial nature of the court system and no. how to deal with questions? Not at all. The only way I actually knew how to deal with this was when I came here and I did a um, witness, professional witness course. Okay. And then it kind of teaches you, you know, how to sit in court, how to approach the barrister. Mm. sit to the side facing the judge, that type of thing. But in South Africa, we were never taught that. We were informally taught, but it wasn't formal, you yeah. know, okay. so. I kind of and it wasn't sort of examined. Of yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. it's just something you had to pick up. Mm. Something you had to, to pick up. Yeah. You would go with a more senior qualified specialist to court and see how they do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. tell me, um, tell me, uh, uh, Jill, I'll put, put this to you first. Can you give us a, um, a really interesting, surprising example of some of the some of the work that you come across, even in your relatively short time here? Um, there's not a lot of well, like autopsy examples. Um, so in South Africa, there's a lot of traumatic and violent deaths, but I haven't seen a, someone um, um, being um, using a samurai sword uh, in the form of suicide before, you know, impaling it through their chest and torso. So that was weird. And did you, was that here in, in Ireland? <laughs> in Ireland, yeah. Right. I thought I saw almost everything but um, was, that was a first. <laughs> I, I, I think the audience would probably generally share your surprise at that, all right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the kind of, not the kind of thing you come across every day. No, yeah. no, no, that was, one wonders <clears throat> what goes through somebody's mind. Hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely different profile of cases. And in that situation then, I mean, <laughs> Do you have a role then in trying to uh, in trying to ascertain is is that is that really suicide or is it possible that there was somebody else involved? That's always part of your role. You get the proposed history. Yes. You you, you also um, as a routine we sit with the investigating officers, the guardian and, and investigating officers. Yes. We do a debriefing session. So we go through the scene, we look at the scene photographs. Um, they would tell us about information that they, you know, uh, managed to um, obtain from people that they've interviewed. We um, may, may or may not get to view CCTV footage, mm. Mm. Um, but we always go into the autopsy room object with an objective mind. Mm. 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 And the question is always to determine the cause of death and the mechanism of death 
and and then to see whether it correlates to the with the okay. history. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was very interesting that you write up a report at the end. You you tell a story, as it were, of how you think this event happened. Yeah. With all the evidence that you have, so. In that sense, it requires some, I won't say imagination, but you have to kind of put an order of events mm. and attach certain wounds and circumstances you, that you know about mm. and create this story to tell what happened mm. on that mm. on a, in a moment. That's kind of how it is. So what, yes. what, what, can, can you advance on the samurai sword? Is there anything more dramatic than that? <laughs> I've never seen as much uh, samurai sword incidents as what I've seen here, that's for sure. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I've come, well, in Ireland there's quite a few, uh, like, fallen down the stairs incidents, a, a lot, quite a lot of those, and what we have to determine, the question is always, so, were they pushed? Yeah. Or did they fall? Yeah. So that's what we have to kind of sure. determine. And the detectives highly, they, they definitely rely on what our findings are. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, we can't tell. Mm. Um, we have to base it mm. on correlation with what they found sure. and what was found, sure. you know, trace evidence at the scene. But they still only listen to what we say. Mm. Um, so that kind of makes it a bit difficult. But most but of the time... Is there a point at which you have to say, this? it, it is not my role here to try to put myself into the mind of the person who has been involved in this? That, that, that where you, you have to stop at the physics and the chemistry? Yes. No, we always do that. Mm. Do you? And, and how, 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 how does one draw that line? You, at what point do you, do you hand it over to the, to the, to the crime investor, to, to, the, the, to the detective and say, yeah? Um, <coughs> I think, so for me, a lot of the times the investor mm. or the detective would want to show me CCTV footage. Mm. And I usually say I don't want to see it because it tends to, there's been a few cases where we go to court and then they say, oh, we're biased because we've seen the CCTV footage. So that gives us one type of perspective mm. or opinion. So I decline the CCTV footage and then I just want the history. Yeah. You know, what happened, the general circumstances. And then I will make my conclusion based on that. So I'll do the full examination. And then once that's completed, then I'll mm. kind of tell them, okay, this is what I okay. found. Is it similar to what you found on the CCTV footage? And then that's how we So, correlate. yeah, so you go into it unbiased, as it were. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember talking um, to Jack Harbison, who was the, uh, for many, many years, many of the audience will remember Jack Harbison as the, uh, as the state pathologist. Uh, he was a rather eccentric character. He's going around with a deerstalker hat like Sherlock Holmes. But, um, I remember having a drink with him one evening and I was saying to him, it really must be very, very tough work and very tough psychologically. And he said, no, he said, it's cold and it's wet and it's miserable and you're out in the ditches. But he said, basically, you're dealing with, dealing with physics and chemistry. And, mm. uh, but he said the people who, who really have the tough job are the people who have to put their minds in, who have to get inside the minds of the people who've done these things. And I remember he was really very he was very passionate about that mm. that he his, his care and his concern for the crime detectives as he said i just go down i measure things i weigh things i do tests and i go home but these guys have got to get inside the heads mm. of the people who've done these terrible things and at the time of course i mean i remember him saying that you know that for the for the for the crime detectives in those days there were no supports there was no uh, clinical supervision, there was no debriefing, there was no um, psychological support services for them. Um, at, 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 at really, at, I presume they're a lot better now, but certainly in those days there weren't any. Um, Andrew, I want to come back to the book again, if I may, for, for, um, for a bit. Um, what, 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 you, 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 your, your original focus as an archivist um, was on the was on the great houses of the south side of Dublin, uh, Fitzwilliam Square. Out of that came John Delahunt. So what brought you to the north side? What brought you over to Rutland Square and Capel Street? I suppose it might have just been for a change of change of scenery. Um, it was true what you mentioned earlier on how uh, at a certain time the north side was the more fashionable yeah. side of the city. 
it was when the Earl of Kildare built his house where the doll now sits uh, in 1745. And he said very confidently at the time, wherever I go, fashion will follow me. And, and so did. he brought his influence to the south <laughs> and that happened. And it was also the case that the streets and squares of Marion Square, Fitzwilliam Square and so on are all part of the Fitzwilliam estate. That became the Pembroke estate in 1816, just okay. a fluke the same, same year as the book. But because of that, that whole Pembroke Strait, which is a huge area, uh, was kept under the supervision of one entity, and it was managed as a single entity, and because of that, it was maintained to a much higher star standard. Okay. Whereas the Gardner Estate north of the river, which is Rutland Square, Mantroy Square, and so forth, um, was split up. It was sold off piece by piece, yeah. and you know, single houses fell into disrepair, then a whole terrace would fall into disrepair, and bit by bit, the north side became uh, less fashionable. And it was also the case that after the Act of Union, because of the flight of money and uh, yeah. influence to London, there just wasn't the demand mm. for these houses anymore. So, uh, you know, they congregated to a certain side, one side of the river or the other, it happened that the south side turned out to be the more fashionable. But it was nice to be able to take this moment in time in 1816 yeah. and set the book in on north of the river, you know, in the final kind of years yeah. of the heyday yeah. of this particular yeah. area. And, and you, 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 you do that um, really well. You have the sense of a very elegant, uh, very elegant urban landscape, beautiful houses, churches, um, and 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 when you contrast it with what subsequently happened uh, to that that part of Dublin, I mean, it's 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 come back somewhat from what it was. Yeah. But if you compare it to what happened to it, say by the be by the early years of the twentieth century, yeah. when it had literally become a, a huge urban slum mm. with tenements and people living in appalling conditions, yeah. it, it it actually it actually asks the reader to make a significant leap of the imagination to go back and see that Dublin in the elegance and the, uh, and the prosperity that you, that you describe. Yeah, but, but a lot it. of those buildings are still there <coughs> and um, so you can see them and you, know, mm. you, can, you, can, you can imagine. I, I was part of a writer's group, I have been for 10 years, uh, a writer's workshop that we meet every week and that's, uh, we help each other with our books. We would meet in the Gresham and so I would be walking home uh, from the Gresham to uh, Drumcondra. Yeah. And so I remember just passing through uh, Parnell Square, looking around, going, why don't I set my next book here? And yes. Seeing the Rotunda, seeing Charlemagne House, imagining the Blessington mm. Street Basin just up the road, you know, Sackville Street, O'Connell Street behind me. Uh, it just seemed a, a natural place to put it. And it seemed like a nice change of, uh, change of scenery after setting the first one in. Yeah, in the yeah, yeah. Another question I want to ask you about the book. Um, the 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 I, I'm sure most people here probably have read the book by now, but for those who haven't, uh, the the at the, at the backdrop of the of the plot is this group um, uh, sinister uh, fundamentalist uh, group uh, called the Brethren, and uh, they're the they're the bad guys in the story and. Um, uh, Andrew uh, draws two or three very strong personalities uh, on that on that on that on that uh, sheet, uh, the, 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 the the members of the of the brethren. So I, I'd never heard of the brethren. I, I never knew about about this body. Tell us a bit about them. Well, that came out of my research into my first book, which was a social history of Fitzwilliam Square, and. In Fitzwilliam Square in the 1820s, this group uh, were founded, uh, an evangelical group, called themselves the Brethren. They later uh, started meeting in England, and their first meetings there took place in Plymouth, and afterwards they were known okay. as the Plymouth Brethren, still today known as the Plymouth Brethren. But their very first meetings happened years before in Fitzwilliam Square. So because of that, because of my research there, I had this group, all I had to do was pluck them out of the 1820s and drop them into 1816, a bit of historical okay. license. Uh, but they just seemed this natural uh, antagonistic group for Abigail, who is, you know, so headstrong. You've evilged them up a lot though, haven't you? I've made them more darker <laughs> than, they, than they were. It's funny, the, uh, 
from, from that Fitzwilliam Square book, the most comments I get are letters come from current day Plymouth, Plymouth Brethren members. Yes. Because I was able to correct a mistake that they had made in their congregation histories. They all believed that their first meetings took place yeah. in a certain house. And because of a strange switch around in house numbers in the 1860s, they had all, all along been looking at the wrong house. Uh -huh. So I was able to correct that for them. And so I got a letter, <laughs> got a letter one day from a guy in Northern <coughs> Ireland and he introduced this whole thing and he wanted to see how I got this information and could he confirm it. And we had this great back and forth and he was delighted with the fact that I was able to correct this mistake in their congregation history. That's wonderful, yeah. But I didn't have the heart to tell him that I'd made their group the bad guy. <laughs> 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 that would have spoiled the moment. But it's funny, when you do historical fiction, there's always somebody out there who knows more than you do. When I did the, um, the first Swallow book, A June of Ordinary Murders, I have... Uh, our hero, Detective Sergeant Swallow, goes to the Phoenix Park early in the morning, 7.30. Uh, he goes up in a, in a carriage, uh, a horse-drawn carriage, up to, um, up to the, the chapel is gate uh, where, where two bodies have been found uh, in the copse of trees. And <clears throat> he surveys the scene and he, um, he, does, uh, he does what he has to do. The photographer arrives and then he decides to go down to Kilmainham Station which in those days was noted in the Dublin Metropolitan Police for the fine breakfasts that they served. But um, anyway, he, he, he gets his driver to take him out the gate anyway, and he's down for eight o'clock for, 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 for breakfast. But six months after the book was published, I got a telephone call at home from a man. I don't know how he got my number. He said, Mr. Brady, and I said, yeah. He said, you're the fellow who wrote the book about the Phoenix Park. And I said, yeah, he said, he said you have this fellow swallow going in, he said, in his carriage at half seven in the morning into the Phoenix Park through the Island Bridge gate. And I said, yes, indeed. He said, he says, I was the gatekeeper at Island Bridge for 35 years. <laughs> he says, that gate never opened before nine o'clock. <laughs> so I said, look, I said, I'm very grateful to you. I said, if we do a, if we, if we do a second edition, I'll make a correction. <laughs> yeah. That's a terrible problem for historical fiction writers. Always have it to fact check. There's somebody out there always who knows more than you do, but... Yeah. Somebody <laughs> pointed out to me that uh, letterboxes weren't invented till, till 1850. Oh, really? I've been using letterboxes throughout. I said, nobody's going to know that. <laughs> <laughs> when I got caught on once, I described um, uh, Sergeant Swallow as deciding to take the weekend off and go to the go to the Wicklow Hills, and my editor at the time, very astutely, said the term "weekend" was not invented <laughs> at that at that at that at that stage. Let me just go back uh, into the into the into the science, as it were, then, and look, come up to date, and maybe look a little forward. Uh, Jill, let me just maybe start throw this to you first. Uh, obviously, there's been amazing advances in the 20th century. Mm. Uh, I mean. It is extraordinary even to think that when the Kerry Babies case occurred here, which a lot of people here will remember, and I certainly remember as a newsman, I was involved in the coverage of it at the time, but even at that stage, there was no DNA. Um, so that's where we've come in, in 40 years. Do you want to tell us what you think might be the next big thing on the horizon in terms of forensics and criminal investigation. Do you want to do a little bit of, a little bit of uh, fortune telling? Oh, that's a very good question. It has to be technological, I would think. Um, yeah, something technological, I'm not sure, but um, there's the limitations with DNA because you have to have the DNA sample that you sample from the crime scene, right. from the, the victim, and um, then you have to match it to a suspect. Yes. Um, and that can be quite difficult if you don't have a suspect. Sure. Um, or you might have DNA from the suspect, but you, I mean, you don't you have no idea where this person is. So um, I would have liked they to for, for, not like, but the ideal would be for there to be a database of every single human being, you know, a DNA database. That's quite an ambition. Fingerprint database. <laughs> yes, yeah. But obviously <coughs> there's a lot of um, controversy around human rights issues um, and the safety of the data. 
and the fact that the data can be misused or abused. Um, so if we could have something like that, then I'm sure uh, a lot of, it would be much more difficult to get away. Mm. And mm. a lot of cold cases could possibly be yeah. 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 solved. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, 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 it's an extraordinary concept. Uh, but in my novels, in the Swallow novels, I mean, in the 1880s, we have uh, Harry LaFair, who is the Dublin medical examiner, speculating on the possibility that one day it will be possible to identify people by the ridges on their fingers. Uh -huh. And uh, thinking, well, this is actually, you know, this is pure realm of, of fantasy. But uh, so let me throw that to, to, to you, Heidi. What, what, what do you think? Fast forward for when you're, when you're an old lady and your granddaughter is uh, moving into, into, into forensics. What will she be doing? Well, I think by then, probably everything would have been automized. Yeah. There would probably be an AI um, performing the post-mortem. But, um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but nowadays, I mean, we, we do talk a lot about uh, CT scans and MRI imaging. And a lot of countries use CT scans only to do post-mortems. Mm. I know, um, mm. like I went to Switzerland for, on a ballistics course, and they don't do post-mortems on um, individuals that it had uh, gunshot injuries or stab wounds, which is quite strange to me because um, I think that you still need to, I mean, the gold standard is still doing the post-mortem, but they just do a CT scan and that's where they'll document the injuries and then they'll take it to court and that's how they do their post-mortem. So I think we'll probably in the future rely a lot on imaging. Okay. And, uh, Digitalizing. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, it's it's fascinating. I, I actually have the answer to the question that I asked you, mm. because I asked my seven-year-old granddaughter this this afternoon. I told her what was coming. I said, "So, if you were a detective, and you wanted to invent something which would be really helpful to detectives, what would it be?" And she came up. With the answer she said, <coughs> very simple. She said, "Time travel. That you could move back and see what actually." <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So if you were just turn the clock back to the crime scene, and then you'd, you know that would that would that would that would that would. Now you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so again, with 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 Abigail, I mean, is is she going to develop? Are, are we going to see a lot of advances in her time? Um, you can't leave it where it is. Well, I'm writing a sequel, so there might be No, some there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about that. But, but whether there, uh, there's enough time for different advancements in forensics, I'm not so sure. Like, I set the book in 1816 because it was the year without a summer, so I just picked on that event because yeah. it created this lovely, eerie, gothic atmosphere for crime fiction. But then 1816 also happened to be the year of publication of a book called The Epitome of Forensics. It was written by a man called George Mayo, who was a surgeon at the time, and he was absolutely frustrated at the inability of coroners and some inquests to identify cases of murder yeah. just because the coroners lacked the medical knowledge. They tended to come from legal backgrounds rather than medical backgrounds. Mm. And so Mayo wrote this book um, a very clear textbook setting out how to deal with a body when it's discovered, what the marks of various injuries are, what the tests for poisons would be. The, the test that I mentioned earlier on when I did the reading, that came straight out of Mayo's book. So the timing of it that was set in 18, or that was published in 1816 when I said the book was uh, brilliant for me, became the textbook for Abigail. So if she does have future forensic adventures, that will be what she'll be referring to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yes, yeah. I mean, it would be, it would be, it would be, it, it, it wouldn't be right just to leave it where it is. I know. You know, it's got to go, got, got, got to go forward <laughs> from, uh, from, from, from here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, looking at 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 um, at the at at at, at the uh, I suppose the the situation pertaining to to serious crime here in this jurisdiction, as both of you have found it. Um, you probably, I think you were saying earlier on before we came in that you both came expecting Ireland to be a fairly quiet, relatively crime-free mm -hmm. 
society. Has, has, how do you feel about it now? I mean, has it... Uh, no, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah. If you compare it to South Africa, it's not that bad. Sure, yeah. yes. Yeah. Our point yeah. of reference is quite bad. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, we don't do a lot of homicides. We get a lot of suspicious cases. Yes. But not a lot of homicides. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Um, there is uh, an upward trend, though, but one has to consider that the population is increasing mm. and all those factors. Um, and post COVID. Post COVID, yeah. yeah, coming out of isolation, um, those are all factors that play a role. But it's not out of proportion, you know. I think one does expect over time for things to change. Mm. You know, life is not stagnant, um, and um, island is expanding. But um, I'm fresh. I came here in December. I just been here for four years, so yeah. already I think things have changed a little bit, eh? Mm. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of cases are drug related. Mm. That's the problem. Mm. Mm. So. I'm thinking about when when I was um, involved in the setting up of, of the Garda Ombudsman, and we recruited police officers from abroad, including a few from South Africa, to come in, and uh, they uh, they 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 thought they were coming to a paradise. Um, mm. Lots of golf and. Uh, you know, quiet life, and um, I remember one, one, um, one uh, Australian detective coming back from 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 Donegal, saying he had never seen such wild children in his life. <laughs> <laughs> he was planning planning to go back to Western Australia, <laughs> as he described them. He said they're feral. <laughs> feral. Uh, but but I mean. Uh, it's always interesting. Well, Irish people are always interested to know what what visitors think of them. But I mean, do you, do you think probably we see our crime situation maybe out of perspective? Do we do we do we uh, do we do we have an exaggerated sense of, of 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 the scale of the problem? I do think so. You think so? Yes. I mean, if I compare to even twenty eighteen, the amount of cases to what we have now. Yeah. So I mean, yes, you have a. There is a reason why you do feel that way. Okay. So I understand that completely. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, looking around the audience, and there's a few people here probably of my own vintage, I mean, I can remember there were many years in this country when I would have been a, a young journalist where there were no murders at all. Mm -hmm. And the, the Garda Commissioner's Crime Report would say, you know, that you'd send a report into the Minister for Justice. You know, it gives me pleasure to say that this year no murders were reported. And, and then most years you'd have one or two, and they were nearly all domestics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some, some, some farmer's wife took a pitchfork to him or something like that. And yeah. <laughs> it, 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 usually he needed it. Um, that's, that, that, that's by. Look, um, we've, 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 we've gone up and down over a period of 250 years, and yeah. there's a huge amount in between that we haven't been able to, to focus on. Um, but. Uh, it's 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 really uh, trying to sort of s to 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 to, um, to spell out the parameters of this thing. It's, it, we could we could we could we could take the whole evening at it. But look, uh, we're going to draw to a close at that point. Um, uh, I just like to uh, thank our um, our panelists. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to thank um, Heidi and Jill for being with us. It's 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 wonderful to be able to put human face to uh, an institution that thankfully very few of us have to engage with directly. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge and, and, and salute the, the uh, important public work that you do. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hugely important. Uh, it, it, it can't be easy and uh, we do very much appreciate the fact that you're there to do it and grateful and thankful to you for, 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 for doing it. And um, th thank you, thank you for that. And uh, Andrew, we wouldn't be here were it not for you. Um, like to again, I know. I mean, there's been a genuine appreciation of and warmth towards the book. Uh, you've obviously touched a vein with a lot of people. Uh, you've given us a wonderful, a wonderful crime story, a wonderful human story, a wonderful insight into 
part of the history of our city. Um, and in the old phrase, a damn good read. Yeah. So thank you for that. You. And uh, <clears throat> the good news is I can tell you there is a sequel. Yeah. So I'd just like to say to the audience, thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for engagement. Thank you for being here. And thank you once again to our panel.